Good to see you. It's, it's so wonderful to be here. It's my first time here. You know, when, you, when we were growing up, we would all say, we'll see you next year. And we thought it was so funny. Remember when you were in school? And you'd, go, you'd break for Christmas break. And you'd say, I'll see you next year. And we thought it was hilarious. But now we've heard it how many times in our lives, right? But this is my first time here in 2023. And it's so wonderful to be here. It's so wonderful to be experiencing a new year. I don't know about you, but 2022 was really, really rough for me in so many ways. I mean, just rough. When anything could hit, it hit. But it was also the most powerful year that I've experienced because of those hits, right? So with, with the newness of the new year, I always like this time of year because everybody has more hope. Everybody's reflecting on the past of 2022 or the previous year. And we think about the things that didn't work. And we're starting to make these uh, resolutions, right, of, of how we want things to get better. And, you know, the, the famous resolutions every year, what are your resolutions? We write them down. Sometimes after you get a certain age, you don't even do resolutions anymore. Right, are you with me? So um, they, so we think about those resolutions and, and we think, okay, this, this is the year that I'm going to get it done, right? How many of you have stuck to your resolutions so far? Oh, oh my. <laughs> Oh, there, there's a few. How many of you already broke them? And how many of you haven't even started? That would be me. <laughs> that would be me. I'm still going to get on that treadmill. And this year, I'm going to cook and bake more. I don't know how, but I'm going to do it. So we just... 91% of people that make resolutions don't follow them. Did you know that? 91%. And most of them... Oh, you think that's low? <laughs> <laughs> and most of them within the first four weeks fail them. But it still makes us all feel good, right? We set goals. Um, I got something better than resolutions. I think we should make declarations, and I think uh, we're going to do that at the end because with God's word, we can do that. So the same can be said about our faith when, when you know, the resolutions, they don't work sometimes. Sometimes our faith, our, our prayers are the same way. How long have we prayed for something and we pray and we pray and we wait and we wait and how many times have we said, you know what, it's just not meant to be, God's not listening to me. How many times have we gone through that? I know I have when I just pray and pray over something and I see other people getting it and I'm not getting it and I'm starting to wonder if maybe God answers other people and not me. I'm starting to wonder, oh, you know, maybe I shouldn't be praying this and I give up and the answer was probably just right there. Tommy Barnett did an illustration, and I wish I could have found it, but they have an, he had an illustration of people waiting in line to get into the hospital, a woman get, waiting in line to, to get to that baby, but the baby never happened because they never were believing for it. Just around the corner, if they would have just gone around the corner, the answer would have been right there. So God is listening. He just does a different kind of timing than we do, right? And in the end, he knows. So today I hope to address why sometimes our prayers aren't answered and why we can't seem to hit the target. Why can't we seem to get those resolutions going? Why do we seem to just not be able to get through? I hope to address that at the end. And I was going to pray at this time, but Cassandra prayed a beautiful prayer. And, and I just, I'm just trusting that God will release the words that he wants me to speak and, and hold back the words that he doesn't want me to speak. So last year, our series is First Things First, as you can see on the, on the board. And last, year, brother, last week, Brother Jerry was here, and he started us off with being a friend of God. And I know he did a beautiful job of explaining that God desires for us to be closer to him. God doesn't want us to just be servants. He's called us to be his friends. You know what friends do with one another? They let you know what the other one is thinking. Friends will let you know what the other one is thinking. You know how you call your friend, hey, guess what happened? That's what God wants us to do with him. He wants to let us know, wants us to let him know what we're thinking. But guess what? God also sometimes reveals to us what he's thinking. And sometimes I used to say when I was younger and a little bit not as mature, I used to say, oh, God, so what do you want me to do? Go prophesy it? What do you want me to do? Go call the person? And God would just say, I just shared that with you because, because you're my friend and because he knows that I will pray for it. So God wants that from us. Just keep that in mind. Today we're going to learn about that life of faith and how to put things first. So what is faith? 
Is it simple? Is it something that you just like, boom, it happens? Or is it something that it's so complex that we have to keep trying and trying and trying? Is it simple? Is it complex? Yes. It's both. It's both. It depends on what the situation is. Faith can be, I've gotten healed instantly, and I've gotten healed from my psoriasis, which was like 20 years that I had psoriasis. And I kept believing God, and then I would say, ah, oh, you know, maybe this, he, maybe he heals other things, but not psoriasis. So that went on for like 20 years. And then God healed me, and I've been healed for about 15 years now. Amen? So he's simple, and he's complex at the same time, you know? If we could figure God out, then, you know, we wouldn't need him, because we got him all figured out. But beyond all that, whether it's simple or complex, faith is in action. And we need to put that action. And it's required on our part to be able to please God. Because the Bible says that without God, it is, without faith, it is impossible to please him. So in other words, faith is not just simply hoping and praying. Oh, I hope, I hope God listens. I hope my prayers are answered. Oh, I hope this happens. No, hope, uh, faith is beyond hope where I know God heard me. Everything's falling around me, but I know God heard me. I'm scratching, but I know he's going to heal my psoriasis. But the bills are coming in, but I know that he's my provider. I know he will provide for me. I'm feeling really weak, and I don't know if I'm going to make it through, but his word says, his word says that he will be there, that he will sustain me, that he will uphold me, that he will help me. So faith is not going by what we see, but by what his word says. Amen? So this year, 2022, I had a rough time because my grandkids were sick. They were sick a lot. They were, uh, they were hooked up to machines. They couldn't breathe. They were lifeless. They, uh, my grandson, because this is my grandkids, yeah. Not one of them looks like me, except maybe the one in the front. And definitely none of them look like Derek, right? <laughs> so, but uh, the little one at a month old was already in the hospital. The little girl had breathing machines, and that's when I was here last time I know I talked about it. But what got me through, you know what got me through? The scripture from the very beginning. And I'm going to repeat this over and over again every time I see you. Rejoice in the Lord always. Pray continuously without ceasing. Give thanks to God for everything, for this is the will of God. So we rejoice in the Lord. Not, we don't, I don't rejoice that she was hooked up to machines. I rejoice in what he's going to do. I rejoice that I can call on him. I rejoice that he will give me that peace. I rejoice because of who he is, not because of my circumstances. And as I did that, an overwhelming peace came over me. And then I prayed continuously. I called on some of you to pray without ceasing continuously. And I began to give thanks that he blessed me with those grandchildren, that he blessed me in so many other things. And the peace that surpasses understanding was right there because I chose to rejoice. I chose not to focus on my situation. And I, you know what else God is speaking to my heart right now? Sometimes we think that we're not worthy because we didn't do the right thing. Sometimes we think that God is on the throne waiting to punish us and say, bad girl, Trish, I'm not answering your prayers this week. But that's not who God is. He's waiting, he's waiting. And he sees that we run this way, he sees that we run that way, and he's just like, I'm right here. I'm right here. So 2022 started because at this time last year, my daughter had a four-month-old and she discovered she was pregnant. They're 14 months apart. And after we discovered and we got through the shock of her being pregnant, um, in this day and age, I don't know how we're shocked when somebody's pregnant, right? Because <laughs> there's, there's all kind of birth control. She's a nurse and her husband's a nurse, right? So, but she was shocked and um, she was working overnights. And, and after we got over the shock, we experienced a joy because she was pregnant. A few weeks later, we're rushing her to the hospital because every, by all indications, she was miscarrying. And um, we prayed. And just as a protocol before she left, they did an ultrasound and there was a heartbeat. And they said, you did not miscarry. So we went back, we started rejoicing. She was still bleeding. Another month later, she had the same scare. 
and they took the ultrasound, the baby was beating, the heartbeat was beating. We had a, another one, and she never start, stopped bleeding till the sixth or seventh month. And they said that there was a possibility because of the position of her placenta that she might have to be bedridden. And there's one thing to be bed bedridden, but when Annalise is bedridden, we were afraid of that, right? But we just trusted the Lord, and then some diagnosis, she tested positive for certain diseases. It was one thing after another, but God. But God. Amen? So I rejoiced in him, I prayed continuously, and I gave thanks because I knew that was the will of God. And he was born without any disease, and he is just absolutely wonderful blessing. Amen, Derek? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I also experienced a lot of tragedy within my body. At the same time when I was uh, preparing for a message on the presence of God, I got Ramsey Hunt, and the whole side of my face was frozen. And because I waited so long, they told me the possibility of recovery with my age was not a good one. And, but I rejoiced in the Lord. I prayed continuously, and I gave him thanks. That was not going to be my key verse today, but it's turning out that way. So during that time when it got so bad, because I couldn't blink my eye, I felt like stab wounds in my eye. I would just close my eyes no matter where I were was, and I would acknowledge the presence of God. And it was so deep, because God is with you. I taught the kids in junior Bible quiz, what, is, what does it mean that God is omnipresent? What does it, what does it mean, guys? Herman, you remember? <laughs> He's everywhere at the same time. He's everywhere. He's everywhere. He is with you when you're ma doing, making wrong decisions. He is with you when you go into rooms that you shouldn't go. He is with you when you're watching things that you shouldn't watch. He is with you when you're doing all those bad things. And he's not with you to judge you. He's with you to redeem you. He's with you to turn everything back around. He is with you. Amen? And I always say that the prodigals make God work over time. Because the Bible says that he goes before you, he goes behind you, and he's around you. And the Bible says that he chases after you. So they make him work extra hard, right? So when a believer believes in God, when a believer believes that he is there, he, when you acknowledge, he's always there, whether you know it or not. He's always there. But when you acknowledge that he's there, oh, he pours his blessings on you like you wouldn't believe so I refused because I waited so long for grandkids. I used to borrow Jay Beck's grandkids. <laughs> Seriously, I did. Didn't I, Jay? <laughs> I would take them, and I would just borrow her grandkids, and they were kind of my grandkids too, but I had to be careful. And so I would borrow her grandkids. You know, most, most uh, people want to be princesses when they grow up. I wanted to be a mom and a grandma. So for a long time, I didn't have grandkids, so I would borrow grandkids. Because I just love the way kids think. I love kids. But so when I had finally had grandkids, I refused to, to not kiss them. So I kept getting reinfected with what they had. So that's why this year was a, a tough year for me. But like I said, but God. God is always there even when we don't feel him. And as he's not there to judge you the way we judge others. He's just there with open arms waiting for you. Acknowledge his presence because it will build up your faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, for the conviction of things not seen. For by it the men of the Old Testament testified. Slide three, it says, verse, verse uh, Verse 3, it says, By faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. And the Passion Translation explains it and exposes it a little bit better, so let's read it in that. Now faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things that we long for. It is the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. 
Faith empowers us to see that the universe was created and beautifully coordinated by the power of God's words. He spoke and the invisible realm gave birth to all that is seen. He spoke and God's words gave birth to all that is now seen. In other words, faith is believing in what he said simply by taking his word without seeing it, without re requiring evidence. We just believe him because it's what he said. Having faith in spite of everything falling around us or when things are starting to fall apart. Basically, it's believing his word and trusting him, knowing that what he said in his word, we're going to take it to heart. We're not going to listen to what the neighbor said. We're not going to listen to the voice in doom here or the voice in doom on TV. We're going to listen to the word of God. Because when you listen to others, it's nice to vent, but they don't lift you up like when you use the word of God. So what is faith? The dictionary meaning of faith is Complete trust or confidence in someone or something and a strong held belief. And the biblical meaning, or in Greek, says faith, believe, trust, confidence, fidelity, and faithfulness. And the word fidelity just stuck out in me because fidelity when you're married is so crucial to your relationship. And fidelity when you're serving God is so crucial to our relationship. When we pick up other idols or we pick up other beliefs or we entertain bad thoughts, fidelity. He wants fidelity. What does fidelity mean? Fidelity means is faithfulness to a pers person, cause, or belief demonstrated by continuing loyalty and support. Being faithful and loyal without having anyone else captivate you the way God captivates you. So faith is not something we can manufacture. It's not something that we can conjure. Faith is always received from God, never generated by, by us. It is a virtue that can be worked up, that cannot be worked up by human effort. To all of us is given a measure of faith. God says he gives you a measure of faith. It's, it's up to us to see what we are going to do with it. Are we going to stay with a small measure of faith? Or are we going to make that faith grow by getting in the word of God? So how do we get that faith? Um, this week, uh, my son Jordan said, Mom, should I take the day off and you take the day off and we'll just spend the day together? And which I thought was so sweet because he's never ever offered to do that before. And I said, son, I can't. I, I got this message and I'm stuck in this one, like in the introduction. I'm stuck with it. He goes, I said, if you can help me with that, then, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe I can do that. And he goes, I got it. And instantly he goes, he goes, you got a mountain that's in the way. You want to move it, but it wants to stay. You need the power that comes from F-A-I-T-H. And I'm like, I taught you that song in kids' church. <laughs> he goes, it was? I go, yeah. And he goes, oh, yeah. He goes, got a mountain that's in the way. You want to move it. It wants to stay. You need the power that comes from F-A-I-T-H. Hey. So don't tell me kids' ministry is not important. <laughs> oh, my gosh. He's 31, and he's still singing it. He's still quoting it, right? Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How do we get our faith? Like it said in, in Hebrews 11, 1, that, that everything was created by the words of God's mouth. It says here again in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. This is not just an ordinary book. This is a book, his word is living, it's active, and it has power. So this word produces life. So what the dead areas in your life, when you don't know what to do, you read the word, and your faith will be instantly generated. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a situation where I didn't know whether to take plan B or plan A, what direction to go, what to do first, because I had all this stuff to do, and I couldn't hear from God. I get in the word and just start reading. It's not even uh, targets 
scriptures. It's just reading. And when I close the word, it's like something was sparked inside of me and wisdom fell from heaven. And my faith is energized because of the word of God. You can hear a message over and over and over again. You can hear a scripture over and over again. When I was teaching my junior Bible quizzers scriptures, they'd say, oh, we know that one already. But you know what? It doesn't matter how many times you hear it. Every time you hear it, it will produce life because his word is living. His word is active. It is more powerful than a double-edged sword. It is able to divine between soul and spirit, joints and marrows, the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. It's his word. It's his word that does that. I can't tell you how many times I know how to watch my mouth. I know how to not say things. When people offend me, I know how to keep my mouth shut. But my heart is a different story. Because in my heart, I'm, I'm like, hmm. And then if I allow it, it'll take me here, here, and there. But his word is able to divide between soul and spirit the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So when someone says something rude to me, I'm like, what are you really saying? What's really in your heart that triggered you to say that? God will immediately give me that wisdom because his word produces life. It's active. It's alive. Faith is an action required to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Hebrews 11, 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You seek him with all your heart and he's going to reward you. And I have to tell you, with all the trials, with all the attacks, I have never felt the presence of God on my life more than I did in 2022. So am I glad it's over? Yes. But at the same time, the presence that was felt, I don't regret 2022 at all. Because it drew me to a place higher than I did not know I could be. Let me tell you what it says in the TPT. And without faith, the, the Passion Translation. And without faith, living within us. Faith, living within us it would be impossible to please God. For we come to God in faith knowing that he is real and that he rewards the faith of those who passionately seek him. Here's the thing, you can't have faith without dependence of God. And sometimes we just say to God, you know what, I got this. I got my little nest egg. I got it all figured out. I'm gonna retire, I'm gonna do this. And then something happens, like people lose jobs. And then you got to rearrange your financial status. My husband was a sought-out sportscaster in Philadelphia, and in 2020, when they couldn't interview, he did not have a job. And so we could have uh, focused on that and, oh, woe is me, but we didn't. We said, God knows all things, and we choose to trust him. We choose to believe him. God gave him show after show after show. He doesn't have one job, and now he has multiple jobs, Right? How well do you know him? And where is your faith? Where is your faith barometer? If we have to be honest, if I have to be honest, my barometer goes sometimes, right? One day I am so full of faith and the next day I'm like, when COVID hit in 2020, I got up and I had some symptoms and uh, my daughter Tina had symptoms and she was explaining all her symptoms, and they were the same ones as me. And so we didn't go to church because we didn't want to take any risks. So we came back. That day, I stayed in my office, and I prayed. And I prayed, and I prayed. And one day, I was like Elijah, and I was killing 400 uh, prophets here, another 450 over there. And there was no way that COVID was going to get me. And the next day, I was still Elijah hiding in the cave. The next, not the next day, the next 10 minutes. So I went from the altar of killing the prophets to, to the cave and hiding out, and it was back and forth until I said, no, 
I'm either going to trust him or I'm not. And I said, I choose to trust you. I began to declare things. Sure enough, we all got tested, and they all had it except for me. Mm -hmm. I got tested again. They all had it except for me. And I made a choice when we did come back in 2020 in my my other church to, if an older person who hadn't been around anyone came to hug me, I wasn't going to push them away. I was just going to hug them because... I said, and Lord, I need you to protect me. And he did. He protected me all the way through until last year when I had COVID. I started 2022 with COVID and I ended it with COVID. <laughs> and, but, you know, like I said, I was able to see God's presence and feel God's presence like never before. A life of faith is not easy sometimes. But if we're being truthful and if it's done properly, it can give you the most peace of mind that you've ever had that you've ever experienced. So I'm gonna ask you this. I want you to talk to yourself, ask yourself these questions. Lord, is there something that I need to give up? Are there changes that I need to make? So I want you to close your eyes just for a couple minutes and just ask and see what God, God speaks to you. Again, they're on the board. Is there something I need to give up? Are there changes that I need to make? And let's just see what he speaks to our hearts. Okay, whatever he spoke, I want to ask you this. Are you willing to give it up to move up? Are you willing to give it up to move up? And I ask you that question because God just asked me that question a couple weeks ago. I knew God was calling me to make a change and accept a challenge, but I was resisting. I wanted to stay where it was safe. I wanted to stay and not be moved. I didn't want to be troubled. I'm good, Lord. I'm good, Lord. And all of a sudden, I heard God say to me, Trish, are you willing to give up so that you can go up? And I thought 2022, I had already gone up. But obviously there's more. There's more for me. So as I contemplated the message, I ended up changing it because God just kept reminding me of some revelation that I got here over 20 years ago. And um, I didn't know whether I should share it or not, but I heard it mentioned somewhere and I knew that it was a confirmation. So I'm gonna, I wanna talk to you about the eagle and how the life of an eagle really parallels our lives in so many ways. It was right here in this church that God gave me this revelation. And as I prepared for my message, it just kept coming up. So I toyed with it, so now I'm just, I'm just gonna tell you. The eagle is just such a majestic, beautiful being. We can learn so much from these animals. Eagles have these wings that the end of the wings, there, there's some openings and they cause expansion that is just so beautiful. And it's, look at the wings. Those little wings just cause them to be different from all the other birds. Those wings are designed that in, the, in, in a storm, those wings are designed to, for the storm to take them up higher. That thermal, uh, the thermal thing that happens, you know, the gases from all the, the, the heat goes under the wings and it causes them to rise up. But as majestic as this eagle is, this, there's smaller birds like crows and hawks and kingbirds and other even small species that can easily take the eagle down. You know how they take them down? by circling around them, circling around around it. But the eagle is wise. The eagle knows that if he doesn't rise up above the tormentors, if he doesn't rise up against those that are resisting him, those that are trying to bring him down, he knows that he's got to rise up. He cannot sit here and entertain the crows and the hawks and the nuisances of everyday life. He cannot do that. He's got to rise up 
or they will bring him down. How is that like us? The eagle can fly as fast as 200 miles an hour. The discipline required, acquired during this adversity that the eagle has causes him to be one of the strongest birds around. So they make their nest, not low, they make their nest up to 100 feet high. But you know what it takes to do that nest? They've got to pick up sticks and go up 100 feet, pick up more sticks, go up 100 feet. And they've been known to say that in the eagle's nest, there's pieces of lumber, there are broomsticks, there is fur, there is cloth. There's all kind of stuff that you would never imagine. I wouldn't want to build my house with a broomstick, right? But they get what it takes. And they say that an eagle's nest can be up to two tons, three tons. That's three cows. This is a man-made nest, but the nest was, was a replica, an exact replica of one that fell because the tree couldn't sustain it, because the eagles just keep adding and adding. And that's where they train their young to fly. It's big enough. It's like a little hot tub, right? The eagle is the, one of the few birds that can glide and not flap its wings. It glides. I com- and then the chicken, they flap. And I compare the two because we fluctuate between being a chicken and being an eagle. Right? Let me tell you what a chicken does. When they see a storm coming, the chicken runs around, uh, quacking, quacking, flapping, 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 causing pandemonium. And this chicken causing pandemonium will go to that chicken and incite that chicken and incite that chicken and that chicken will incite. Pretty soon, they have, pretty soon they've incited pandemonium and the whole camp, the whole coop is just in pandemonium, high anxiety, flapping their wings, uh, quacking, what do they do? They don't quack, they, they, what they, whatever they do. They making all kind of noises causing all kind of fear, causing all kind of anxiety. But the eagle rises up above all that chaos. I do not need to be held back. I need to rise up to the heavenlies. And I know we sometimes go from one to the other, but God's goal is for us to live a life of faith where we don't even think about inciting pandemonium. We don't even think about going to that person and bringing them bad news or trying to incite a riot. Or try, we don't even, we shouldn't think about that. We should think, ah, uh, something's bothering me. I'm shooting up to my heavenly father. Isaiah 40 verse 31 says, but those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The word wait there, we think, oh, we're just going to wait. You know what? I'm just going to watch some Netflix and binge, and I'm just going to wait. And God, when you got that taken care of, you let me know. I'm just going to play some video games. And when it's done, Lord, you let me know, because I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. That's not what that word wait means. The word wait means with anticipation to linger, to bind and twist together like rope, to intertwine, to bind together by twisting, to expect. It's an action verb. It's not a silent verb. It's not a passive verb. It's an action word. You wait, you, you twist, you get his will, you get your will, and you twist, and you linger, and you wait on God until your will is intertwined with his. Your will becomes intertwined with his and you know exactly what to do because you have the mind of Christ at that point. So wait is not a passive word, it's an active verb. Uh, an active verb. You wait, you read the word, you pray, you rejoice, you pray in, c- continuously, you thank God. That's how we wait. Like a waiter waits on tables. Writing down scriptures posting them on your wall, posting them on your dashboard, getting your phone and putting, the, putting it on your notes. That's how we wait. 
quoting and declaring the word of God. So the doctor tells me, you're old now, you expect more diseases. No, no, no. I am waiting on God. And then this word just really just makes me really happy. Mount up. It means, it doesn't mean, I used to think mount up. Okay, you get on a horse, you mount. Or you just mount and you just sit yourself. This word mount means to shoot up at 200 miles an hour because he says wings like eagles. You shoot up towards God. You exalt, you excel, you ascend up, you recover and you restore. You soar upwards towards God's holy of holies. So friends, when the chicken is running around with pandemonium, when the hawks and all the other birds are trying to bring the eagles down, the eagle circles around until he gets its momentum and he shoots up towards the heavenly and he rides above the storm. Can you show the picture of the eagle again? The clouds are beneath him. And guess where the storm is? Under his feet under its talents, under it, he rose above it. But because of that thermal thing that's happening to him, what it does is it releases the heat from it, releases a gas that produces heat, causes the wings to expand, and causes them to rise up so that he is basically just resting. He's not doing any work. He's still being obedient. He's still trusting God. He's still letting the wings, the storm carry him. But he's not running around wondering how he's going to get out of the situation. He's risen above it. He has risen above it. So in times of trouble, what do we do? Do we linger with the chickens? That they're running around like their heads are cut off? Do you go, into per, do you go to, from person to person in panic? Get stressed out, start telling people off? They needed to get a piece of my mind. And like my mom always told me, you can't afford to lose, give out any pieces from your mind. You know? Or do you leave the irritations behind and rise up above and allow the wind of Father God to shoot you up and carry you in the midst of the storm? The nest is a pretty powerful thing. When it comes to the eaglet, when it comes time for the eaglet to leave, you saw the nest. They're, what they do is they train, how they, they train before they go out and they shoot up in the air, expand their wings, and then they come down. They're practicing. And some of them are really independent and they fly the coop and they shoot off and they go on and expand and become what God created them to be. But there's some others that are still in the nest and they don't want to get out. They don't want to leave the comfort. But this is my nest. I want to be with mom. I want to be with dad. They don't leave the nest. They don't want to leave the nest. So when they don't want to leave the nest, you can see mama eagle just throwing sticks everywhere She removes the fur, she removes the cloth, she makes sure that there's some sticks to poke you. She makes it as uncomfortable as she she can for them so that they can be encouraged to leave. Because she knows that there is something greater for them. She knows that God has a purpose for them. She knows that they were meant to fly. She knows that they were meant to create their own family. She knows they got to get out. So she makes it as uncomfortable for them so that they can get out. And yet sometimes they don't want to get out. So they go as far as getting a little bit of food and putting it on a limb a few feet away and they don't feed them. Maybe the hunger will want them to go out, fly a little bit and catch their food. But some of them still refuse and refuse. So it gets to the point where mama has to push them. Do you know where Father God, for the Father Eagle is the whole time? Circling below. Waiting to see if one of their baby, his babies fall so he could catch him. He knows that he has 
the ability to fly and stoop down 200 miles an hour. He knows, he doesn't doubt his abilities. So as mama is pushing him out of the nest, daddy is waiting down there, just waiting to catch them. To catch them and take them back up. And let's start all over again until you're strong enough, until I know you're strong enough, until you know you're strong enough. I want to tell you that God, Father God, is hovering around your nest. Whatever it is he's asking you to do, whatever step of faith, whatever flight risk he's asking you to take, he's not going to say, let me know how it turns out. He's right there. Father God is right there to catch you if you fall, but you're not going to fall because he's going to make sure. And God is saying, so where sometimes we just say, you know what, I'm, I like my independence, I got this, Lord. He's telling you, I've got this, and I've got you, and you will not fall. If you choose to trust me, if you choose to have faith in who I am and what I have done and what I will do for you, I've got you. And I believe that's a message that God is saying to you today. I've got you. I had to take a leap myself and make a choice and make a decision earlier. I wanted to stay in the comfort zone. I wanted to spend more time with my grandkids. I wanted, I just, I don't know what I wanted, but I just didn't want to jump. I just knew I didn't want to jump. But when I heard God say to me, are you willing to give up so that you can go up? Without thinking, I just said, yes, yes, Lord, whatever it is. And I'm going to tell you something. That the minute I said that, the windows of heaven opened. It didn't suddenly happen. He had already been working on my behalf. But he opened my eyes, and I saw how this was orchestrated, how that was orchestrated, and how this was orchestrated, and things just started to work out because I chose to have faith in him. And I'm telling you, if it's easy and possible, it's not faith. And I know that's going to, oh, I don't know if I want to live a life of faith then, Pastor Trish, if it's not going to be easy. And I'm telling you, it is so worth it. Amen? It is so worth it when you're walking in his divine plan, in his divine will. So why are sometimes, do we not succeed with our resolutions? Why are sometimes our prayers not answered? Why do we not, we try and we try, but we just can't seem to hit that target? Why? Well, we're just off a little bit. Why? I really felt strongly the Lord say to me that, do you want to go get Cassandra? that instead of wrestling doubt or fear, maybe we need to start declaring. Instead of hoping, instead of praying, maybe we need to, instead of New Year's resolutions, what if we made New, Year, New Year's declarations? What if we had the guts and the, 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 the strength to just declare? You know why? Because it's a commitment. If I say, oh, I'm gonna be healed, then people are going to ask me, are you healed yet? You know, people, if I say, oh, God's going to do this, then it, it's like a commitment, right? But what if our miracle is right here, right here, around us or hovering beneath us? And the answer, the miracle is waiting for us to declare it from our lips. Maybe that's all that's missing. Maybe we need to be taking the word of God and start declaring it. Back to Hebrews 11. By the power of God's words, he spoke, and the invisible realm gave birth to what, all that that is seen. If God's words are that powerful, if God was created, we're created in his image, he was created in a way where he could speak things and they happen. What if we begin to take the promises of God and start declaring them over our children, over our children's lives, and believing it? 
What if instead of resolutions, we did declarations? What does it mean to declare? To say something in a solemn and empathetic manner, to publish, declare, proclaim, to avow, acknowledge, and confess. There's, so some, there's something so powerful about declaring God's word. And, and, and I want to do that today. If you want to come up to the front, if you want to stay in your seat, we want you to just think about what God is asking you to declare for 2023. What does he want you to declare? What has been bothering you so much that you know you need to take that step of faith? What is it? Or maybe you sh you're not where you think you should be or where you know you should be. So close your eyes just for a minute. Sandra, could you, you guys sing that song? He knows your name. 